So good evening, and thank you everyone for being here. So I'm here today to, to talk about a project I worked on last year, in which we built an integration solution based on WDC2 ESB. So a little bit of context first. <coughs> so this client is a very large automotive company with hundreds of thousands of employees, huge numbers of applications, flows, services, and hundreds of IT teams. So as we'll see, this had some impact on the, the solution, how we designed it, and how it was used and operated. So what we ask you to do is build an integration platform to, to replace the existing one. So we had to allow on-premise applications to expose easily their services on the internet in an easy and secure way. See, this would allow also front ends to, to be built more easily. And last, we, we had to also expose external services, so SaaS uh, functions, to on-premise applications. Some technical um, context also. Most of the applications that, were, that would use our integration solution are hosted in a self-owned data center, so no cloud or anything. And the existing integration solution was built uh, a couple of years ago, so it would focus. It, <coughs> sorry. it was focused on uh, exposing services to fat clients and to authorize employees that would uh, authenticate themselves with a secure token that they would physically uh, plug into their, their computer. So quite a different. Um, use case than the, the one we're building, which is more focused on APIs and web services. So we had to build a new solution, and it was chosen to build that on the WS2 ESB uh, 5.0. So the main, sorry, yeah. so the main feature we we had to build was first manage the incoming calls and make sure that every call was uh, authorized to call this service before going through. Then we have some dynamic routing, meaning depending on the, the country or the brand that, were, that was uh, used, we would call the different backend service, then sometimes do some payload transformation, and then finally manage the environments and the credentials, meaning we would need to, to know for each environment what would be the, the right URLs to call for different services and which credentials to use. This project came with some technical constraints. So uh, since it was the first project built on the budget to components at this company, uh, they were really, really, really cautious. So we had to build it so it, was really, really, it wasn't very dependent on the, the budget to technology. And then it would be a shared platform between multiple projects. So we had to, to make sure that it was integrated with the existing tooling, so deployments, CI, CD, and everything. And last, the, the licenses were paid by the JVM instance, which means we had, to <coughs> we had to optimize the number of instances, and we started with only one to produce two instance for the, every application. The technical team also had some requirements for this project. So the first thing was they asked us to offload all the payload processing outside of the, the ESB. So it was offloaded to a web, a web server. And then every task done inside ESB has to be stateless, uh, so that it would be easy to horizontally scale them and to put them behind a run robin hot balancer. And, <coughs> sorry. and last. We'd, we do, would also need to, we, to share instances between different environments, meaning that we would have to expose the same service for qualification and for integration environments on the same instance. So this, this had some implications on the, the sharing of the platform also. Uh, so that's a high-level picture of how it would work. Um, first, you had the incoming HTTP connection that was handled by the security appliance that we would uh, open the, the TLS uh, cipher and then take the, the authentication information from that, put them into headers, 
and, and uh, give the, the, the request to the ESB. There, we would first begin with the authorization. It was a common sequence that would call the LDAP directory to make sure that this application and this user was allowed to call the, the service. And then we would get into the, the real part of the API. Most of the time, what is done is that we use the command sequence that, was, that would offload the, the processing of the payload to the bus. So it would call the bus with information about the, the call and with the payload. The bus would look into the, the routing table, find what was the transformation that was needed, execute it, and then come back with the new payload, then the, uh, the name of the endpoint to call, to call next, and the name of the credentials to use for this call. Then the ESB calls the backend service, and the response goes back with, if required, is again transformed by the web, web server, so by a server in JBoss. And then all of, that, all of those components would ship the logs in a ELK component that would allow us to, <coughs> that would allow us to uh, fo follow the flows and to know where, where the flows has gone, or how much time was spent in the, at each step, what are the, the usage statistics of each services, and everything. On the more technical side, we had two instances of the WC2 ESB in each on its own Linux VM. Same thing for JBoss. And then we had a third instance of the WC2 ESB that was used as a registry in which we would uh, store for all of the other instances the endpoints URLs and the credentials. So actually what we built was uh, a way of using the various two ESB as a multi-tenant component. This was done with uh, naming conventions, uh, common practices, and some tooling, um, because the multi-tenant features of the various two ESB wasn't uh, flexible enough for us, because we had to share connectors, sequences, and it wouldn't, uh, even if you would have used it, it wouldn't have allowed us to, to ensure we had a, a fair sharing of resources between different projects. <coughs> and so we had these naming conventions. That would, uh, what we needed was to, to deploy on the same instance a service in multiple versions from, uh, pro provided by different applications for different environments, and also link that with the credentials that would be needed for this service, depending on who was calling us. So all this resolution was done in the routing table, and the naming conventions was used to name the, 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 the items in the bytes 2, so the sequences, the APIs, and eventually the, the cars, the archives you deploy in the bytes 2 ESB. So we had some, we built some components that would be shared between different projects. Um, these components were used at the same time to ease the work of the projects and to actually make sure that they would use the platform in the way that wouldn't um, prevent others from doing things. So the first sequence that, we, that would be shared between everyone was the authentication sequence. We saw this one. It's the one that calls the LDAP directory. Then we had the routing and payload processing uh, offloading sequences that would call JBoss and with the, with the payload get the new one, and get the, the name of the endpoint that it needed to, to call after the, after one. Then we had a credential extraction sequence. This one is interesting because it would call the, um, the budget registry, and then find the login and password. That would be easy. But in some cases, we also had to, to, to use um, SSL uh, certificate, client certificate, to do external calls. So we had to store SSL certificate inside um, Java Key Store in the in the Java, in the registry. So this this sequence was used to, to extract that, and then we also built on top of on top of that uh, SAS connectors because we had to ex expose external services to internal applications, so that not every internal application had to 
rebuild the, the world authentication uh, workflow with these uh, services. And the last two are pretty specific because there was one that allowed us to have a, a good, the good operability of the, the platform because we had a common error handling sequence that would always log the same things and always return the same error messages to the different applications. And it would also, uh, depending on the headers of the request, uh, know if it, would, if it needed to answer in JSON or in SOAP or in some other format. So that was the important one. And last, the logging, logging sequence. This one is important because it, uh, it makes sure everyone follows the same format of the logs. And then it, when it gets shipped to ELK, we are sure we can analyze that and get the dashboard we, we require for that. So this, these shared components were very important for us because it allows us to, to make the, the platform uh, usable for projects and efficient for projects at the same time. On top of that, we, we, we had to assure the, the platform was uh, at a good operability from the start because it was built for, for large projects and large companies. So we, we built uh, some practices and some tools to ensure that. First was we integrated into the existing uh, deployment tools uh, that were already be used, that were already used for other projects and other technologies. So this evolved to be able to deploy sequences and connectors to, to WSO2. And we also did the, uh, the environment and credentials management. This would uh, make sure that you wouldn't have URLs and password in everyone's code. So that's a good thing also for, for probability, credentials management, we said, and last, the log centralization. So these four main points made the, the probability of the, the platform uh, good from the, from the start. And this was important because it was a, pro a project that was common between the developers and the operating teams. So that's why it was a main focus since the beginning of the project. So I have shown some of the things I'm, I'm proud of and now what I, what I would have done differently if I could have chosen. Uh, first, I would work on easing the development uh, workflow. First by easing the, the setup of the developer's workstation by putting every of the components, in, uh, for instance, in Docker or in any container so that you wouldn't have to set up WSO2, JBoss, Postgre on each developer workstation. That would make it, things much easier. And then we would work on easier testing and more mocks defined interfaces because we, we worked with backends that uh, gave us some great specification, but we should have worked more on the testing things and generated some mocks to be sure that we would uh, run tests more frequently. And more generally on the, on the solution, uh, I would like to have built uh, a more integrated solution. So you have seen, we have uh, the barrier statue, JBoss, Postgre, multiple instances of all of that. And so if you want to only expose a new, new API, you have to, to touch a little bit of everything. So that was done because we, we didn't want to be too dependent of the barrier statue. So we, we have loaded quite a lot of, of things. But I think it would be much easier if we could put back some, some logic inside the WSO2, at least for the, for the routing and the credentials management. I think it would make, make much more sense. So the, the real lessons from this project, what were the implications of the, the size of projects and organization of the, on the solution? First, since it was a large investment, we started with a, a little very little dependence on the project. So that was a good thing because it was reassuring for everyone, but then we couldn't use all the features of the, the project, the new project we were using. Building a platform for multiple teams and for a lot of teams means you need to build some, some multi-tenancy uh, capabilities and to create some complex naming conventions to be sure that no two projects and no two APIs will, would, would clash. So that's, that makes you uh, apply strict conventions, but they, they get quite complex. 
Same thing for the large number of projects and APIs. It makes you build something very scalable with simple mechanism. I said every, every logic was stateless, so it would be able to scale. We would be able to scale that horizontally with just a uh, lot of simple load balancers. And, and then large number of projects mean you also need good probability from the start and being able to, to know where something failed, why, and to give back some, some logs and some information to the project. You cannot, you cannot think that the, um, the production team will be able to help every project in production all the time in in timely manner. And last, the, the fact that we used uh, a new, re relatively new technology for uh, an industrial solution mean that we had to build quite a lot of tools to, to integrate this product, this project with uh, existing tools, with existing tool, with existing practices, it's like uh, deployment and CI/CD. So that was quite uh, complicated. So just to, to finish, the good thing of working for a large organization and on a large project is that, is that you start from the one with good practices because you don't have a choice. But the bad thing is that you have to build a very a quite complex solution just because of the size of the project and the number of uh, people that are going to use it. Uh, so maybe if you had a little bit more decentralized solution, it would make locally things simpler. So with that, thank you. And if you have any question, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.